everyone, and uh, welcome to today's Spaminar. It's the uh, Society of Pop Artists and Managers uh, monthly online gathering for live theater prop professionals and pretty much anyone who is interested in stage props. I'm Anna Catton, uh, SPAM member since 2005, uh, props artisan since 1999, and most recently the founder of Reset, the online distribution center for ideas, materials, and uh, pretty much anything that is theatrical entertainment related. So check it out, resetyourset.com. Um, but more importantly, the SPAM organization is an association of professional prop educators and prop managers from the non-for-profit non uh, producing organizations with an international communication and support network that shares resources, information and solutions, techniques, as well as safety information, continue education and stock. We promote the highest professional standards among prop artisans and craftspeople and promote the field of props to potential prop professionals while working to establish educational standards for the training of props artisans. SPAM was formed in 1994 to create fellowship among the prop professionals to address issues of common importance to create parity with other production areas. We now have over 150 active members reaching from Hawaii to Ireland and Canada to Florida. So, aloha, jiahuich, hello e, and sup. With previous SPAMinars, we are requesting a pay what you can donations. Uh, to help support this programming and our annual grants for early career prop professionals. If you can afford to donate, the link will be in the comments and during this session, and we truly appreciate any help that you can give. We are a collaborative art form, and so the more we can help each other out, the better we're all going to be. But while you're here today, Emer Murphy is going to talk with us about the props at the National Theatre of Ireland the Abbey Theater. Her career began in 1995, when as a stage manager on her very first Fringe show, she was handed a whopping 20 pounds to get all of the show props and was told to bring back the change. In this sink or swim situation, Emer stayed afloat by begging, borrowing, bartering, and making all of the props herself. That sounds pretty familiar to a lot of folks. Uh, perhaps needless to say, she's been bitten by the prop bug. In 2007, Emer joined the Abbey Theater as the full-time prop maker and set dresser. She has taken on her current role as prop master of the Abbey Theater in 2019. Congratulations. As a member of both the Irish Society of Theater Research and the European Federation of Associations and Centers of Irish Studies, Emer has presented original research papers on prop related topics. She is also the author of a chapter in the recently published uh, Paul Grave Handbook of Contemporary Irish Theater. It's entitled Props to the Abbey Prop Man and is a tribute to Stephen Malloy, who retired in early 2019 after 41 years at the Abbey. I'll be your moderator and host for this afternoon. So if you have any questions, please post them in the chat and I'll post them to Imer uh, throughout the presentation and whatever we're not able to squeeze in, we'll definitely be sure to get to um, at the Q&A session at the end. All right, so most importantly, and with that, let's get started. I, Imer, take it away. Thanks a million, Anna. <laughs> So uh, thanks, Anna, and thanks everybody in SPAM for inviting me and also for moving the time slot to um, accommodate me here in Irish time. I really, really appreciate that because otherwise it would have been 12 midnight or so. As Anna has said, uh, my name is Eamon Murphy and I'm the current prop master at the National Theatre Round and the Abbey Theatre in Dublin. Um, I'm a member of the Irish Society for Theatre Research and uh, have completed an MA Material Culture Design History at the National College of Art and Design and I am a proud member of SPAM. So when SPAM began asking for speakers on webinars I knew that there was nothing at all that I could tell my SPAM colleagues about prop making because y'all are amazing so I figured instead I would opt to talk about the Abbey Theatre and the importance that has historically been placed on the objects used on our stages. 
this presentation is partly based on academic research I understood took for my uh, thesis for the MA and partly based on rumor and gossip and uh, it's kind of I'll try and let you know which is which as we go along. So this is a job description. This is Stephen Roy's actual job description from 1978 when he started in the Abbey Theatre. I absolutely love this document. So uh, as Anna has said, the Abbey is unique in Ireland, has always employed a full-time prop master. My predecessor, Mr. Steve Malloy, holds the distinction of being Ireland's longest serving full-time theatre prop master, serving 41 years between 1978 and 2019. This is wonderful. This is, there's a couple of things I love about this. I love a pinball to a motor car or a combine harvester, sort of really places it in the time. And uh, this part here where it says working entirely alone, but in cooperation with all artistic staff. And this other bit down here is always sort of resonates with me. Can be and nearly always is preparing, searching and begging props for two productions at once, Abby and Peacock. I think in 78, two productions at once was the norm, but now it's more often three, sometimes four productions at once before COVID it was anyway. Um, so, oopsie. Uh, Rick Knowles, author of Reading the Material Culture, acknowledges, quote, theatre practice has always and inevitably dealt with stuff in all of its messiness. It engages with the thingness of the material world in ways that few other art practices do. Knowles also acknowledges that the theatre adds, generates things in abundance, knowing reference to the sheer amount of things prescribed by playwrights within the text of every script. In my very first interview for this thesis, I managed to get playwright Frank McGuinness, who's one of our leading playwrights and author of um, uh, many plays, but a very important one called Observe the Sons of Ulster Marching Toward the Sun. Um, so I got Frank to admit something that we've all suspected when he told me that when he's writing, he's unaware how much stuff he's actually written into the script. I think we all kind of guessed that but I got him to say it. So the quote is that he says, you never realize that actually, it always comes as a complete shock when you see the sheer size and scale of the demands that you are making. So after getting that, uh, if I hadn't learned anything else when I was researching for my thesis, I felt like I was, I had done my job. But however, he admits that and then remains completely unrepentant as did playwright Marina Carr, who's the author of uh, By the Bug of Cats among, among other plays. Um, this is the woman who writes a dead black swan into a play, so, you know, she says, if you need it, you need it. I have great faith in people and what they can do. So we are those people. Uh, the magpie tendency of prop people combined with the Abbey's long history and status as a national cultural institution has contributed to the abundance in our prop stores. Whenever the telephone system is upgraded or the costume department get new steam irons or the offices invest in new typewriters or filing systems, the old things often find their way into pop storage to be used on stage. And as the Abbey is a state funded theater, which was the first of its kind in the world, there may also have been traffic to and from other cultural and state institutions throughout the years, but particularly in the early days. And we certainly have furniture that in our pop stores is stamped with the letters OPW, which stands for the Office of Public Works. And they are the government body which looks after Irish heritage buildings, such as our government buildings, Dublin Castle and Kilmainham Jail. And, um, certainly not in my time but in Stephen's time they were always borrowing furniture and things backwards and forwards so oopsie um this is uh, meant that we have often preserved genuine artifacts in our prop rooms often purely by accident there were never any records kept so it's impossible to know what came from where uh, case in point, this is a pile of documents that intrigued me when I started in the Abbey. This is a massive corner in the prop room that is stacked to the ceiling with all of these letter trays and all of these documents and ledgers. And I started looking through them at one point. Um, they are genuine documents mixed in there amongst prop documents made by prop people over the years. And so I bought, the Abbey has an archivist, a full-time archivist, and I bought her down to have a look because I was concerned because we all, we can see what happens. This is an old ledger. I think the date on this one was the 1930s something. Um, this is what happens when actors are left doing writing business in a corner. So they scribbled. So we, <laughs> this is someone scribbling all over that ledger. So when I bought Mairead down, in case they were of any interest, the very first ledger that I handed her, which wasn't this one, it was a different one, 
was actually turned out to be the Dews Ledger from the short-lived Abbey School of Ballet, which was founded in 1928. So she and she had no idea that it still existed or where it was. So that's the problem uh, with a lot of props. We cannot verify the provenance of a lot of things that came from before 1951, when the Abbey Theatre was uh, damaged by fire. When the building was still smouldering, actors and other staff went through rooms, pulled down portraits from the walls and threw scripts and other documents out of the office windows in an attempt to save them. This, so this next slide, whoopsie, sorry. <laughs> This next slide is a prop list for a play called Sancho's Master from 1927. So this is an example of the conditions that some of the documents and scripts that were rescued from the offices during the fire or while it was still, while they were putting it out. This is um, where it's been singed and damaged by water from the fire uh, officers. Uh, when you open these archive boxes, you can still smell the smoke from the documents when you open them. So in the scramble to save things, surviving objects were taken to various storage spaces and people's homes for safekeeping. They were, they were literally stacking them out onto the street. So people were just grabbing things and putting them wherever they could to get them safe. Um, but in the long 15 year wait for the new Abbey building, some things never found their way back or were mixed up in, in unlabeled boxes of unimportant things and their provenance and importance were lost. And so, Often, as we all know, where do boxes of interesting things that, that look interesting, but nobody really knows what they are, they often end up in the prop store. So this brings a whole new level of anxiety on board whenever a designer wants to take all of the old furniture, or take all those old documents and break them up and paint them purple or whatever they want to do. We, I always have a moment of, oh, I don't know what that is. Um, or someone decides to do a clear out and throws away who knows what. So there's a lot of stories uh, over the years. There's a story that uh, there was a, a particular sort of abstract painting that had appeared on the Abbey stage several times over the years and it had been there since God's own time, as they say. Um, and then one uh, Abbey theatre manager took a fancy to it and said to the prop man, give me that, I want to put it in my office. And it was later apparently discovered by a, a VIP who was visiting, who recognised it as an undiscovered Jack B. Yates. Um, Jack B. Yates is one of our preeminent uh, uh, painters he's the brother of wb who's one of the founders of the abbey so you can completely see how that would happen that it would end up in a prop store and it was either that it was on the wall as an artwork and thrown out to be saved during the fire or even possibly that he uh painted it as a prop initially because he's handy as a painter before he became famous it could have been either thing so it's little wonder then that our prop rooms contain such a bewildering variety of objects. Also, when I was writing the thesis, I had a moment where I thought that the Irish prop rooms, our prop rooms would look distinctly Irish reflecting our canon. So I remember asking the spam members if they would share photos of their prop rooms because I had the theory. But actually, when you shared your photos, they all looked eerily similar to, to mine. So we all had a version of this photograph, which is kind of very Shakespearean photos and skulls. This is actually taken in an old prop room that we cleared out so it doesn't exist anymore but there's a lot of dust and everything on those when I look at it. Um, so we all had that one, we all had a version of this one, silver sort of silverware. Um, it, but in, in other contexts these objects would all defy categorization but in the specific social domain of a theatre they are instantly recognisable and their role is implicit. These are the things of plays. It's a lingua franca, it seems, of theatrical objects. It's, it seems to be universal. But uh, these few next few might be a little bit more Irish. So we've a lot of our canon is, is based in pubs. And uh, so we have a lot of Guinness bottles. When, when I was um, doing research for production of Juno and the Paycock a few years ago, I was on to the archivist in Guinnesses. So they have their own archivist now. And just to make sure I was getting the right size and shape and color label and things for the era. Um, and when I sent her pictures of our Guinness bottles, she said, I don't even have that one. <laughs> so, and it's only in the Abbey. We've only preserved it in the Abbey because we've used it on stage as a prop so many times. So, uh, so that's the Guinness bottles. Then there's kettles. These are, I don't know if they translate, but these are cast iron kettles for water. So in uh, Ireland, when your chief form of heating and cooking and everything was the open fire, these were massive kettles, different sizes of kettles. So the, the bigger ones were for washing so to heat the water for the baths or to wash. 
clothes and the smaller ones for to keep for food for water or cooking or for making tea which is a very Irish pastime of making tea and then this one which is what everybody thinks we have in our stores and yes we do because we have a lot of religious iconography in our the plays of our canon so that's religious statues but that's only a tiny very amount of the ones that we have so in the same way that material culture historians can study objects to learn more about the time and place they, they were made and used, pop managers use pops and dressing to act as cultural and time period signifiers to strengthen the belief in the world of the play. In an, in an interview for my thesis director, Connell Morrison noted the power of objects to act as, quote, little social documents, which is a I'd love the description, and suggested that a pop manager's role is akin to that of a social archivist. Another definition I come I love comes from a brilliant book called The Stage Life of Props, if you've not read it. Uh, the author, Anders Sofer, has described theatre as a, quote, fast, self-reflexive recycling project. And again, this is a particularly accurate description when the theatre also happens to be the National Theatre of Ireland with our remit to examine, explore and challenge the Irish condition. So at this point, I'm going to have to give you a brief and overly simplistic potted history of the foundation of the Abbey Theatre. So buckle up and also I really hope that you can all understand me because I know I'm speaking very quickly. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century throughout Europe, there is a growing tide of nationalistic fervor and thirst for reform in the political zeitgeist. At that time, Ireland is still under English rule and Dublin was known as the second city of the empire after London. Dublin theatres are largely receiving houses for English touring companies performing the most popular plays of the day. The Victorian taste for romantic melodrama has dominated theatre for much of the 19th century. The stories are dramatic with fantastical um, storylines populated by stereotypical characters, swashbuckling heroes, evil villains, virtuous maidens, etc. They also contain stage Irish caricatures of a type that are becoming increasingly unpalatable to Irish audiences. For example, drunken, stupid or scheming Irishmen. There's uh, an entire subgenre called Irish melodrama that I can't even get into here, but um, which presents a, a sort of disnified, bucolic, disnified idol of Ireland, and it has a lot to answer for. Um, in this essay, Naturalism in Drama and Ibsen's A Doll's House, Dr. N. Ekambaram notes that, quote, conformity and revolt are the rhythms that govern the theatre world. So the revolt against melodrama began in the late 1890s when several new experimental theatre companies are founded across Europe. The Irish Literary Theatre and the Moscow Art Theatre are amongst the most famous. These are theatres for playwrights, e.g. Um, Anton Chekhov in Moscow, writing a new type of play. It favoured natural performances of real situations in everyday settings. These modern plays swept aside the, quote, cliche-ridden and moribund melodrama as they sought to explore and articulate the meaning of life in significant terms. That's another quote from Ekambaram. The Irish Literary Theatre is founded by four writers, Lady Gregory, W.B. Yeats, George Martin, George Moore and Edward Martin in 1897. They pledged to create a new national dramatic movement and they intensified their early plays with a strong nationalistic element, emphasizing the authenticity of their plays as depictions of real Irish people, as opposed to the stage Irish caricatures that have normally been seen on stages. A parallel literary movement forms around a renewed interest in idealized forms of ancient Irish language, games, culture and myth. Yeats being the chief proponent of this, which is known as Celtic revivalism. There's another scarlet rumor around some of the Celtic revival plays. Um, these are plays based on sort of heroic deeds of Irish mythological figures, uh, such as Cú Cullen and Nafina. They're not quite, but let's just say they're the sort of equivalent of, of Greek myth. Um, there's some of the costume designs for these plays are still in the Abbey Archive and they are spectacular. They, they're a, a pastiche of sort of medieval costume. They have, they wear tunics with cloaks with big gold brooches. And they have these, these what are called torques. They're like a gold collar. They have gold bands in their heads and they wear these bangles on the, their upper arms. Um, so there's the persistent rumor that the, the, the drawings are based on ancient artifacts and jewelry from the National Museum of Ireland. And the persistent rumor is that the National Museum of Ireland actually loaned real artifacts to the Abbey to be worn on stage in their costumes. And so when I was doing the MA and I mentioned this in class, one of the women in my 
Class was a curator of the National Museum of Ireland at the time, and she said, we've heard that rumour too. So two national historical institutions or cultural institutions in Ireland have the same rumour. That's, that's a sort of, the sort of rumour that you can kind of legitimise a little bit. Um, in his book, Modern and Contemporary Irish Drama, John Harrington observes that, quote, much of the thrust of cultural nationalism is the rescue of a dignified indigenous culture previously submerged by the powerful colonial culture and notes that at that time, quote, the focus in Ireland is on national independence. To this national focus, drama was a significant contribution, although a problematic one. So one of the earliest and most problematic plays of the Irish Literary Theatre, which became the Abbey Theatre in 1904, was this. This is a poster for Kathleen Nihulahan. It is written by, although only credited to W.B. Yeats and for an awful long time was only credited to W.B. It's actually written by Kathleen, or Kathleen is written by W.B. and Lady Augusta Gregory. They are co-writers on it, although she really only recently got the credit. Um, it is first performed in 1902 and it's infamous. In it, the character of Kathleen is a personification of Ireland and she calls on the young men to lay down their lives to fight for Irish freedom. This typifies the sort of writing that is said to have fed the nationalistic fervor building up at the turn of the 20th century. This is uh, another, another one from the Abbey Archive. This is a program of a tour of England of these new Irish plays. And so it's a kind of a manifesto to taking to England. So it's the reverse of the norm. It's the Irish companies are going over there to perform Irish plays. So there are Irish plays written by Irish people and performed by Irish actors. And it's, it's, a, it's a big uh, moment. So these documents in the Abbey Theatre Archive reveal an emphasis on authentic characterization, but also for me, which was the most interesting, was that they reveal an almost equal emphasis on material authenticity in the, the new plays that they were performing in England. So this is the quote from this program. It is probable that the playgoer whose interest has been stimulated by the announcement of a repertoire of Irish plays will be very surprised to find the men and women whose acquaintance he will make entirely unlike the Irish he has previously met with on the stage. The four authors who contribute to this repertoire have gone direct to the land for their study. Their costumes and their properties are thoroughly appropriate and accurate. For as much as these plays are portions of Irish life, so are they put upon the stage with a care and accuracy of detail that has hardly been attempted before. This is another of the documents from our wonderful archive. This is the front page of the original prompt script of uh, Sings Riders to the Sea, which was written in 1904. Um, I, like, I love these documents. I could spend forever looking at them. This really simple drawing of the set. The uh, Abbey Theatre stage, by the way, is tiny. It's teeny, teeny, tiny. So th there's really only room so you can see a table and a chair and a dresser. There wasn't room for an awful lot. This part up here I love because almost every single Irish actress doing any of the Irish plays that's the business that they were given, making cakes, making cake, which is bread, by the way, they're making dough and it's cooked on the open fire and um, spinning. So there's a spinning wheel in here that you can see it's mentioned. That's, um, so then this is from that 1906 tour program again, this is a description of the, the care taken in sourcing the props and costumes for this particular play. Now we don't know who wrote this, but, but some of the language in it suggests that it's probably Lady Gregory. So it says the property is the properties used by the company are all taken direct from the cottages of the peasantry. That's the bit that would indicate that it might be Lady Gregory. The spinning wheel, for instance, was in use near Gort for over a hundred years until it was bought by Lady Gregory. The little wooden vessels, like little barrels, were bought from the Aran Islands. The cowskin sandals or pamputis worn by the people and riders to the sea came from Aran also. In dressing this play, a young man from the island was brought to the Abbey Theatre to revise all details so that an exact reproduction of the Aran dress is now given. The turf baskets and panniers were bought from the extreme west of Kerry, and many of the other parts of Ireland contributed something. So it's, it's uh, great emphasis is being put on the things being used on the stage. In an essay called Negotiating Authentic Objects and Authentic Selves, Seen Jones investigates the quality of being authentic, i.e. real, original, genuine, or truthful, and what she calls the, quote, ineffable, almost magical power of authenticity. As it relates to ancient artifacts, 
She knows the aura of ancient artifacts, the power of the almost primordial qualities of natural materials such as stone, wood, metal, or animal hide, and asserts that people, quote, use authenticity to, to negotiate their own place in a world characterized by displacement, which is a particularly resonant observation in the context of the early nationalist plays of the Abbey Theatre. Interestingly, also for prop makers, she, she did an experiment. She notes that in experiments with replica artifacts, museum vin visitors will experience the same level of awe if they're standing in front of a replica of, a, of, a, of an ancient artifact, provided that the replica is used in a, in a museum setting and also is a sufficiently good quality copy. So I think that's pretty interesting for pop people. Uh, we, we knew it all along. Um, so this is a quote from, again, from the stage life of props, which is a brilliant book on props. It reiterates the earlier point about the aura of authenticity and authentic objects. Objects bring their own historical, cultural and ideological baggage on stage with them. New historicism, materialist feminism and cultural materialism have taught us that the playhouse cannot be artificially cordoned off from the symbolic economy of the culture that surrounds it. Just like the offstage objects they represent, props are circulated, fetishized and commodified. This is particularly true of the objects used to tell the story of Sean O'Casey's 1916 rising play, The Plow and the Stars. This photo that is accompanies this slide, this is one of my own pictures. It's of a, a display I designed a few years ago on the um, Plow and the Stars on the production that shows some of the most famous costumes and props. So, there's a lot of others, but this, we're gonna be talking later about this pram, this is a particularly important pram, and also this flag. So this now is where I'm gonna to have to give you a brief potted history of the 1916 Rising. So I'm just gonna assume that you don't know anything about the 1916 Rising and just kind of give you a really, really brief and very general overview. Um, Sean O'Casey at that time is a socialist and a writer. And he is involved with the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, which has its headquarters a few doors down from the Abbey Theatre at a building called Liberty Hall. On the morning of the Rising, members of the Irish Citizen Army marched from Liberty Hall to the General Post Office on O'Connell Street, where they are joined by members of other Republican factions, chiefly the Irish Volunteers and a woman's organisation called Cumann na Mon. Cumann na Mon is uh, basically the Irish for the Women's Council, but they were a paramilitary organisation and they were trained in, um, in, they were trained with weaponry and guns and they were prepared to fight. The proclamation of the new Irish Republic was read out by one of the leaders, Padraig Pierce. Um, from the opening address on that document, the, it's addressed to Irish men and Irish women. And the proclamation, which is essentially the proposed constitution of this new Irish Republic that they're about to create, this is the point of the rising, they're going to create a new Ireland. From the very beginning, they gave men and women equal status, and this becomes significant later on. The rebels then seized the GPO, barricaded themselves in, and that's the start of the 1916 Rising. Uh, in a very brief nutshell, uh, it's all over within a week. Um, so O'Casey himself is not involved in any of the combat, although he was around and he was observing, and he wrote the plan on the stars based on his observations that he made in that week. Plow is first performed at the Abbey Theatre 10 years later in 1926. Um, the, the, P, the play centers on the impact of, on the rising of a group of impoverished tenement dwellers and uh, Dublin tenement dwelling is um, it's a particularly and unique situation where former, oh, I say Georgian palaces, massive townhouses of, of the aristocracy, which had been abandoned by the aristocracy when they moved out into the country or moved back to England, um, they are divided up and then rented out by scrupulous, unscrupulous landlords who um, packed as many people as they could into these buildings. So there are enormous Georgian proportioned rooms and they are subdivided up and there could be as many as two or three different families living in one room. So it's, it's a very particular, very, very peculiar and particular type of poverty. And they were the worst slums in Europe at the time. So the date of this poster, the keen eye amongst you will have observed this earlier, the date on this poster, this is Easter Monday. So Kathleen Lee Houlihan, coincidentally enough, is the play that is due to be performed on the day that the rising breaks out. So uh, this is a quote that George Bernard Shaw said when he had seen, um, the first time he saw Kathleen Lee Houlihan, he said to Lady Gregory, 
when I feel that play, I feel it should, could lead a man to do something. I can't even read what that says, but you can, so that's okay. Uh, it, and that quote is taken from the Abbey Rebels uh, book, which is this book here, which I, I like a good prop master, put props behind me. This is a great book. If anyone has any interest in this, it's heavy. The Abbey Rebels of 1916. Uh, so the date of this poster is from the day the rising began. Fergal McGarry in this book, The Abbey Rebels of 1916, says, quote, fearing it might further incite the people, the Abbey's manager, St. John Irvine, cancelled the performances after he heard the first shots ring out on the morning of the rising. There are many members of the Abbey Theatre Company actively involved in the 1916 rising. There are actors, Sean Connolly and Maureen Isulu, who had been in the very first production of Kathleen Houlon, Actors Helena Maloney and Arthur Shields, who later went to, made it big in Hollywood, he went to Hollywood. And he also said, quote, it was the plays of the Abbey Theatre that made me increasingly aware that I was an Irishman. Stagehands Barney Murphy and Pather Kearney, who wrote the song that became our national anthem, The Soldier's Song, and an usher, Ellen Bushell. And these are the people who are actively involved in on the week of the rising, in fact, um, Sean Connolly is the first person killed, he's the first person rebel, rebel killed uh, on the morning of the rising trying to take Dublin Castle. Um, so, so many rebels working in the building, of course there are more, many more rumours about uh, gun running and hiding. There's a, a, a rumour that parts of the printing press from Liberty Hall, because Liberty Hall was constantly being raided at the time by the British, uh, that they used to break the printing press up and hide it in different places around the city and that often it was hidden under the Abbey stage with the props because we're better um, and also that guns were hidden under the stage with the props and there's also another persistent rumour that guns that were fired in the rising that were hidden afterwards in the aftermath of the rising the British rounded up all of the leaders and executed them so there would have been people running scared um, so that some of the guns were allegedly were hidden under the Abbey stage, mixed up with the props and ended up being used as props on the Abbey stage for years until they were taken away and decommissioned because the health and safety came along and then realized that we were using actual guns that were fireable and they were taken away in the memory of Stephen Malloy. He's the one that told me that story. So uh, yes, that's another of the scurrilous rumors that abound. So again, this is the flow and the stars, the photograph that I showed you earlier. So the Plough and the Stars and other stalwarts of the Abbey Canon, such as the Playboy of the Western World, were played and replayed in a repertory schedule which saw the original props and costumes reused for decades, preserved more or less intact until the Abbey Fire of 1951. This fire starts backstage in the set and prop storage area and destroyed all of the stride. This is very Irish, destroyed all of the original sets, props and costumes. However, the Plan of the Stars has actually been performed earlier that evening. So all of the props and costumes are on stage and they're protected. So they survived. And that's the reason that we can really only verify the things, the provenance of the things that are in that production. So this is Pram is one of them. This Pram here survived that fire. Um, the survival of the Pram and other props and costumes adds to their iconic status as material links to the old Abbey and the original production. So if you Google it, I don't have the rights to show it, but there is a famous photograph uh, that is owned by the uh, Dublin Fire Brigade. And it shows a Dublin fireman in, in 1951 rescuing this. So he's lifting it out over all the smoldering chairs and um, wood from the, from the fire because he, because they need it, because it is an important prop. So it, so this bassinet part is all burned away. It's burned down to the to the metal. But the prop master of the day reproduced this section, and they went on that night in a different theatre. So the show never even stopped. They they continued on, and there's there's all sorts of um, links to that production. The last words spoken on the old Abbey stage were the song "Keep the Home Fires Burning," which is sung at the end of the plan of the stars so by two british soldiers um so where am i now whoopsie da, da, da. okay this is uh bessie burgess and Ginny gogan fighting over the pram in the 50th anniversary production which was 1976 so um in this scene if anyone's familiar with the play these two women uh they've discovered that um the, the rising is already is, is ongoing at this point in the play and the word has come back that shops are being looted. 
So they go and grab this pram so because they're, they're going to fill it with, with goodies on their way back. Um, but they fight over it. They're quite vicious fighting over it. So that's the same pram that you saw in that other in other photograph. Um, and also referring back to the uh, program that I read you earlier on the talk about the things that were bought over from Aaron, the authentic objects bought over from Aaron. This shawl here is one of two that were bought over from Aaron in, in 1904 for the first production of Riders to the, to the Sea. Um, it's one of the ones that's referenced in that program. It's one of them has gone missing, but this one still exists and the costume department still have it. It's a very specific dowry blanket, apparently, that they, they used to make for, for women getting married in Aran Islands. So, um, the other significant prop is the flag, of course. So the flag is the starry plough. It's the flag of the citizen army. It's just one of many of the Republican flags being flown because every faction had their own flag and their own insignia but it is uh, the flag that gives its name to the play. It's the center of a controversy when a riot breaks out on the fourth night of the first production in 1926. So this is the famous pub scene in which caused the riot. So just to give you a little background, this character over here is Uncle Peter and he is wearing a, an Irish National Foresters Benefit Society uniform, which is a very sort of um, he represents an older ceremonial form of Irish nationalism. This man here is an Irish volunteer, which is one of the factions, and he's carrying this tricolor, which is became afterwards became our, our uh, the national flag of Ireland. This is the Starry Plough, and um, this man is dressed as an Irish citizen army uh, officer, and this man too. This man out here is what's known as the character in the, the speaker at the window. And he represents Podrick Pierce and other leaders of the Rising when they were speaking in rallies um, leading up to, uh, to try and gain support for in the months leading up to the Rising. So this is characters based on Podrick Pierce or any of the other leaders of the Rising. Podrick Pierce is a famous orator and he did a, a speech at a grave of an old Republican hero in the months leading up to the Rising, which was hugely um, influential. And um, so he's out there speaking at a political rally. These people are coming in and out to get drinks in the middle of that. And these are those other people are the members of the, the tenement dwellers who uh, live in the, in the area. This lady here is important. She is uh, Rosie Redmond and she is uh, the prostitute in the play. So what happens at the time on the fourth night, a group of women stand and begin to shout and storm the stage during this scene. Now, they've, they've, they're there because they know it's going to happen. The rumors have been going around, so it's or they're, they're just outraged. So they've come and they start, to, they start to cause problems. And it leads in the stage being stormed and Yates coming out on stage and doing his famous, you have disgraced yourselves once again speech. Um, in reports at the time and, and afterwards, it was said that these are good Catholic, Irish Catholic women, and that they're just outraged by the presence of Rosie Redmond, the prostitute. However, they're in actual fact, they were led by members of Common Naman, who were mothers, wives, sisters, and comrades in arms of now dead and captured Irish rebels. So they have an entirely different reason for being outraged. So hopefully, this is gonna be a sound cue I'm gonna try and play. And if you can give me a thumbs up, if you can hear it, if you can't, I don't know what will do. Uh, this is Sheila Humphreys, and I took it from the Irish, um, from RT, which is the Irish broadcaster, uh, in an interview that she did, uh, I think in the 70s. So hopefully you can hear this. The, the, the one thing in that play was bringing the Republican flag unfurled into the Republicans. That was never done. And when you bring a, a, a flag like that, for, you know, floating, it's always a sign of delight and victory and everything. And this Republicans would not bring that into a public house. Was that your main objection? That was the main objection. The main objection. They said it was the prostitute. It wasn't. It was easy to put up with her. That was part of life. But it certainly was not part of life to bring an unfurled Republican flag, which we worshipped at that time, into a public house. So that's Sheila. 
And I think it's when she says, which we worshipped at that time, that gives you the real sense of, of the depth of feeling and the reason that, that the riot happened in the first place. It's often covered up. It's often made about something else, but that's the real crux of it, I think. Um, Okay, so here's an interesting, I think interesting, but everyone else might find boring. But here's an interesting sidebar on what happens when you don't get the details right. So this photograph is black and white, obviously, but I have seen a, a color of it in a version of it in color. Uh, this is the touring production, by the way, of, of the, um, the Plow and the Stars. It's the production on the Abbey stage was much more, um, it was much bigger and more significant, but this is sort of touring flats at the time and a, and a floor cloth, which you can see on the stage there for taking it on tour. This production toured everywhere because it was the 50th anniversary of the Rising, so it was in huge demand. But, um, so <laughs> there's a period in Abbey history when the flag they use in this scene is a blue background. This flag has got, um, is a, a green background. It's, I realize I've shown you very poor images of it up until now, but it is um, a plowshare with a sword here, which is, is sort of standing for the revolution. It's a, it's a quite a, a sort of Soviet feeling. It's, it's a proletariat symbol, really, the plow. It's got uh, silver stars on it, and it's again on a green background. However, there was a period when it, it, was, on, it was blue. And the reason it was blue was because Sean O'Casey himself had always insisted that it was blue. And he was there on the morning of the rising, and he was around Liberty Hall, and he was involved with the citizen army. So he said that the flag was blue. He insisted on it. And for a period of time, there's a, an art, Abbey artistic director called Tomas McKenna, who's one of our most famous direct, artistic directors. He came back a couple of times and, and did a couple of different um, runs in the directorship. He had known O'Casey and he also insisted that the Abbey flag should be blue, that the Abbey was going to get it right and have it blue. But this flag was never blue. And because the Abbey was so well known for its authentic props, other companies copied the blue flag. And even Hollywood, when they came to make Young Cassidy, which is a, a biopic, well, very loosely based on Sean O'Casey's life, they, where do they go? They go to the Abbey Theatre and they copy what the Abbey does and their flag is blue. So it compounds the mistake and it amplifies it for years, but there's no evidence to suggest that that flag was ever anything but green. The only thing that there is, I've spoken to Rachel Phelan, who is, um, she is a, uh, textile historian and con conservationist, and she's actually conserved the starry plow flag that was um, thought to be the flag that is was flown on the morning of the rising. And it is now on display in our uh, National Museum. And she was <laughs> very cross with me when she found out that I was from the Abbey and she was, why is it blue in the Abbey? And I, <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. I could only explain what I knew about it, but she, um, she said the only thing that she has, and, it's, and you can see that image as well if you look at it, is that Sean O'Casey painted a watercolor with a blue background. Um, and we don't know whether he was, he was also practically blind. The man had a bottle of glasses that, that were this thick. So it's either, whoops, it's either um, because of uh, him, a vision, eye vision problem, or because it was an original design for the flag that then got ditched for the real one but that's that's because we did it everyone else didn't copy us for a long time so um quick, quick question then yeah do you get a lot of um audience members and uh yeah. board members and whatever trying to you know challenge catch you you know about historical correctness uh for your props on the shows yes <laughs> well, <laughs> well we there was a period in time um, that was a brilliant example I had. I, I usually tell the students to expect the world authority on everything to be in the audience um, and make really, really as sure as they can. Because we did a play, we did uh, Three Sisters one time and the director wanted to have, there's the scene at the end where Masha has been attacked and she is, uh, she's lost her and it's a symbol of her lost innocence. He wanted her to hold a teddy bear when she's rocking at the end of the thing saying, oh, Moscow, 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 as the lights come down. Um, so he wanted her to hold a toy that was a symbol of her lost innocence. And uh, so I researched it and those, you know, all kinds of China dolls or wooden dolls or whatever. And none of them had the same sort of tactile softness that didn't have the same symbolism as a teddy bear. And despite the fact that I told him that there were, there was no way teddy bears were relevant to that time period, he said, look, it's artistic license, that's what I want. So, and he said, 
quote, I'll deal with the letters if they come in, archly, assuming that they wouldn't. And of course, we get an email that says, I can't believe the Abbey Theatre Props Department doesn't know the teddy bears would not be there. And it gave me the entire history of teddy bears and when they were invented and where they were invented and how they were, certainly wouldn't have been in Russia at that time. And it was signed the president of the Irish Historical Teddy Bears Association. So <laughs> you just, you always have to, you have to know that, that these people may be there. And if an artistic decision is made and it was the right one for the moment, it was the symbolism of the moment. And that's, that's fine. It tells a better story, but then deal with it when the people complain that the Irish, the Abbey Theatre Pop Department doesn't know, blah, blah, blah. I cannot believe the Abbey Theatre Pop Department doesn't know that. So, um, so at this point I go, so we come to 2016 and the 100th anniversary of the 1916 Rising. So part of the Abbey's mission statement is to focus on new work while maintaining a, quote, commitment to new approaches and interpretations of the rich Irish theatre repertoire. When the Abbey Theatre announced its programme for 2016, there was little surprise that the Plough and the Stars is listed on there. It would be crazy if it wasn't. Um, so it's in, the programme was entitled Waking the Nation. And it was included new writing, which featured themes of homelessness, national identity and disaffection, which reflected some of the social and political preoccupations of 2016 Ireland, which is 100 years on from Ireland gaining its independence. And then that slide that you just saw already. Famously, the program's failure to address issues around gender inequality created what could be termed yet another riot, the furious backlash, which became known as the Waking the Feminist Movement. And if you don't know about the Waking the Feminist Movement, if you Google it, it's fascinating so uh this i'm in this picture i'm not in this one because i took this one but i am in the official picture i'm over here so <laughs> that was waking the feminist so for the 2016 production of plow director sean holmes admitted that as an englishman so we get an english director there's a certain pressure inherent in doing that play in that theater at that moment in irish history and this is a quote from from sean when i interviewed him for the thesis he said the one thing I knew I didn't want to do was to do something that was slavishly in period. I wanted to find something that would connect from that point in history to contemporary Ireland and the issues that remain the same between then and now. So the poster campaign, so everyone wants to know what, what we're going to do with Plough um, in 2016. So the poster campaign for the production set out its non-traditional intentions long before the rehearsal period began. It did so through the show's iconic props. So taking inspiration from graphic designer uh, Michael Craig Martin and the color palette from the Starry Plow flag, the real color palette from the Starry Plow flag. The poster represents modern equivalents of some of the show's iconic props. So the Victorian bassinet, cast iron kettle and looted Cuban heeled shoes of the original are replaced with a modern stroller, electric jug kettle and Nike runners, sneakers, to communicate a contemporary angle on this familiar play. So this is, uh, let's see, this is the original, as again from our archive, it's the original script prompt script for the plow and the stars. This is complete with O'Casey's own scribbled changes and handwritten notes in the margin. In common with other naturalistic writers such as Ibsen and Chekhov, O'Casey describes in minute detail the setting of the room, down to the colors of the curtains and a green bowl of scarlet dahlias with white chrysanthemums. It's here somewhere, yeah. A green bowl filled with scarlet dahlias and white chrysanthemums, which is perhaps an allusion to the green, white and orange slash gold of the Irish flag. That's just me, question, question mark. Um, so this, at the beginning of this, it says the home of the Clitheroes. It consists of the front and back drawing rooms in a fine old Georgian house. And then he's sitting in here in a Dublin tenement. It's, a, it's a, it, just a distinction to make. Struggling for its life against the assaults of time and the more savage assaults of the tenants. The room shown is the back drawing room, wide, spacious and lofty. So it just goes on and describes air and tiny minute detail. These, um, tenement rooms that there's, uh, I think in the census from 1911, there's one house, uh, one of these big houses that has 126 people living in it. And that just shows you the amount of people that they crammed into these, these the tenements. It was pretty dreadful. Um, so the 1960, 1976 version, again, it was a naturalistic setting, traditional naturalistic set. Although it was, as usual with the 70s fashion, so there's a pretty 70s geometric net curtain going on there in that window and brasses which would have been very trendy in the 70s and this which re really reminds me of it may not be flock wallpaper but it really reminds me of flock wallpaper which was trendy in the 70s um 
So it, 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 I'm lost again. In 2016, Dublin was dealing with a massive housing crisis um, and still is. So I now live in Kildare because I had to give up trying to rent in Dublin. The tenement room that the Clitheroes share with Uncle Peter and the young Covey is a subdivided rundown Georgian mansion. So this is difficult to depict as appropriately miserable because as Holmes says, quote, the trouble with stripped floorboards, sash windows and iron frame beds is that actually with central heating and modern lighting, we all want to live in those houses now. And then women with lots of shawls and long skirts, this just doesn't mean the same thing anymore. So to counteract this, the creative team set this version of Plough in an abstracted contemporary urban wasteland, bordered by green construction netting, graffiti hoardings and social housing tower blocks represented by the scaffolding tower here. The interior of the Clitheroe's tenement room is entirely suggested by the props and the furniture using what Mayor Holt called the associative power of real objects in an unreal setting. Cheap mass produced plastic jug kettles and an electric bar heater are far more indicative of modern poverty than their 1916 period equivalents. This second hand and mismatched furniture is intended to reference the sort found in emergency accommodation or homeless shelters. The key piece being this pull out sofa bed, which is a, a necessity in one room living space. And so when the, when the couple return and everybody else has gone to their meetings, they actually pull out and made the bed as part of the action for the love scene, which was, <laughs> um, the infamous act two bar scene was particularly strong indicator. Again, naturalistic production set the scene in a sparse and shabby but period correct pub, as we saw in the photo earlier. However, today traditional Irish Victorian pubs with polished wood and brass, stained glass, cozy snugs and gaslighting are prized as an ideal and they are recreated worldwide. In order to remove the gloss of Victorian detail, Designer John Bosser used a simple bar counter of rough panelled wood bisecting the open stage with harsh neon strip lighting above. There's nothing comfortable in the bar. Bosser doesn't even give the characters chairs to sit on. They rushed into the bar, gulped down pints as they watched the political rally. So the speaker at the window is being broadcast on the television and large screen television in the way that punters watch horse racing or football in a sports bar today. Disposable plastic cups were used instead of glasses. They were consumed quickly and then thrown on the floor and crushed underfoot. And, and he really encouraged the actress to crush them and then to stamp on them because he wanted that sound. They indicated the bar's stark functionality and the crass impersonal nature of this bar as a pure business. Holmes describes this as a clear moment of audience recognition, which, quote, gave life to that political event 100 years ago. Because you go, yes, now I understand in my body exactly what that is. I understand that reality, be it from festivals or gigs or events or whatever. Bars at those gigs don't care about comfort, they don't have to. Certain period details were retained, such as the military uniforms and starry plow flag. They were juxtaposed with pop culture references to create moments of tension between the 1916 ideal of a modern independent Ireland and the 2016 reality. The starry plow flag was carried into the bar by actors in period citizen army uniforms. There was no modern equivalent for that, so he just decided, let's just have them in their uniforms as they were. So in traditional, as in traditional versions of the play, however, Holmes decides he wants to go for a, a flag riot type moment. So he amplified the perceived disrespect to the flag by having Lloyd Cooney as the young Lieutenant Langan wearing our modern national flag in a cheap synthetic tricolor that we buy and as a, a sort of type that you wear and you bring to football matches. So he, so Lloyd is the whole way through the scene holding the flag like this and every so often raising it up like that. It's a a version of uh, nationalism that is more familiar to modern eyes and also he swapped the flag with the disrespect he doesn't even have a pole on it he swapped it to our, our current national flag as opposed to the citizen army flag because he felt that would have more of an impact and actually on the first preview Lloyd got so carried away with the with the um the applause at the end because it got a huge response at the end that at the end of the um at the end of the, the curtain call and they'd done all the bows, he ran off and then he ran back on again on his own with the flag going like this. Ah! And, and then the whole crowd went, Wah! and there was this massive reaction and then he just left it on the middle of the stage and ran off. So they, they wouldn't let him do that though, but I thought it was brilliant. Um, so da -da -da -da, her being aware of its iconic status, Holmes really, really badly wanted to use the original pram because he was aware that it was the original pram and the whole story around it. But with that pram now an artifact in the Abbey Theatre archive, we used this pram, which is the one that we, know, we now use for the plough, and we used it up until the prefuse. But unlike the other 
versions where we played around with the with the props this didn't work it didn't make any sense it, it confused the conceit so it was swapped out for this 1990s pram and uh, this is a terrible photograph sorry it's mine and um, i took it backstage and it's uh, instead of the objects which were looted by the women in the original script which were untold of luxury at the time in 1916 so they were human heel shoes dresses furs and fancy biscuits that's what's in the script in the 2016 version, the pram is piled with boxes of looted iPhones, iPads, and Xboxes in a nod toward the looting of such luxury electronic goods during the London riots of 2011. So I'm um, finish up here. Four homes, getting the details right, carried as much import in terms of communicating a specific contemporary Irish reality as the Aran Islanders Pampooties did for the Abbey Theatre's original production of Riders to the Sea in 1904. So that's where I'm going to finish up just by saying we're now approaching the 100th anniversary production of Plough. So it's going to be interesting to see how we're going to choose to stage that as a comment on the Ireland of, of 2026. That's it. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing it. Oh, no. This has been fantastic. Um, I think you brought up a lot of really great mm -hmm. uh, comments and points about how all of us as props people have to balance this. Um, this fine line of you know being archivists and you know we but we want the realism and we want to try to find these authentic items and try to make things as real as possible for the audience to draw them in but then there's the weird balance of yes but we're doing make-believe and we're being asked to do things with these antiques and you know archival pieces that you wouldn't practically do you know so like there's the the part that all of us have done at some point where we cut apart a book, yeah. you know, where it just it tears my heart out to do it, but that's what we need to do for our job, yeah. you know, and so it's fantastic that, you know, you're actually able to, you know, have these archives and have this history of the creation <laughs> of the, the, the stuff on stage as opposed to just the stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. No, there's just, um, I can't remember the specific details, but I remember when we were doing Plow, if it was 2016 or it was the version before, there was a, a costume conundrum that had to do with the collar because, you know, they're wearing stiff collars and Uncle Peter is putting a stiff collar on. And whatever was the version of the play, because they get published and republished. And what tends to happen with plays, I find, and I found it before with the George Bernard Shaw, is that people just take out a, a reference if it is no longer current or relevant. So um, so whatever the reference was, they removed it. They went, no, that doesn't happen anymore. Nobody does that. Or, and so in this updated version, it wasn't there. So, but when we looked in the original version and saw the way it was originally written, it suddenly made sense to the costume department. They went, oh, I, I get it now. This piece of business hadn't made any sense until we saw the original version of the original um, reference. And we, I've had that before with George Bernard Shaw as well, where oh, there was a reference to um, somebody's reading a mag what turns out to be a magazine but it was a magazine that was no longer in publication so it was just removed and they, they put the reference was that so he was reading a newspaper but when you know the magazine that he was reading which was a particularly intellectual uh, magazine written by art people and for art writers and things it makes a much difference bigger difference to his character and an understanding of his character that that's what he's reading not just the newspaper so. sure yeah because it, te it tells about the it it lends more in, uh, information about the character itself. Yeah. Um, so we've got a couple questions um, directly to this. Um, are you part of the team that decides what is on stage when a show is modernized? Or is it more like a, is it dictated to you? Both, well actually Sean in, for that production, when, when they, they presented the model of Oxford, he, he said, we're looking for things. We're looking for ways to connect so if you've got an idea shoot so like i wouldn't necessarily because i've never worked with someone before i wouldn't necessarily walk up to a director and say here i have an idea about a problem um so i but i did because he invited us to so i gave him two or three different ideas and uh, and he went with them but he but also the actors were very involved in in that to and fro that they they said you know what would really work here would be if we did this i think that the the flag was actually Lloyd's idea the, and it was brilliant. It was just, it kind of just contextualized the original flag and the rights and the re reason behind it. it was a disrespect of this um, iconic 
flag. And then to see it, to see our flag just worn that way, just it just it was a, a perfect moment, I think, with props, and we all love those moments. <laughs> um, one question, real quick. Somebody was wondering if um, if we could uh, if you could post again the picture that you had of the the um, setup of the pram and the flag, the display that you made. Sure. They were wanting to to uh -huh. <laughs> see that again. Um, and then while you're doing that, uh, does the Abbey archive modern shows to the extent that it has archived um, historical ones? Do you continue yeah. that? It's, it does. Sorry, I'm going to, I'm just going to skip through this and find it first. Um, it it does. Yeah, we, um, it, it's a, it's a constant uh struggle because while you're in the middle of a production and you're trying to get the production up and everything that there is an archivist there's a presence that is marie delaney who is our archivist who is in the background always going archive 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 and it has become a huge deal obviously as we shift further and further and further to digital and to to archive because we don't necessarily anymore have files paper files that go so it, so when i started in the abbey it was still paper files and everything that you did and every single note that you had and you put them into folders and you would periodically send them. Once the show was finished and we weren't going to revive it, we knew we weren't going to revive it, it was sent to Maraid and she would archive them. Um, and now so much is digital and it's going on shared drives and things, it's making it a little bit difficult. So there's a, a whole conversation going on at the moment. Now, obviously this has all been amplified because we've all been working from home and um, the shared platforming is absolutely essential. So we are uh, in the process of working out and we're getting this training starting from next week about using using those platforms and how to integrate um, proper archiving practices into using online platforms. I'm just going to find that photograph here. Um, yeah, I, I, it's funny one because I used to be really diligent about it when they were paper and for some reason when it's not paper it's a little bit harder to to get your head around the archiving of it. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's something about the tactile nature of doing it that, I don't know, makes it quote unquote real, mm -hmm. as opposed to just copy and pasting and, you know, us snapping photos all over the place with our cell phones. It's, it's, it, it feels uh, disposable. Yeah, exactly. And, and that is, and there's so much, uh, I don't know what is going on here. I'm going to try that again. Um, the, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, um, this entire show is archived on the phone like everybody has them I've got entire shows on my phone that I never even put anywhere else that you know that's a really bad habit it's just images where they were so important and photographies you know photographers and they have to go through the, the the sort of tactile experience of printing onto paper and then the paper photographs can be filed and put somewhere safe uh, and now they're just here or they're not or they're in, on the iCloud and they're not uh, necessarily sort of looked after in the same way. I have got so many photographs that pertain to shows that are actually on hard drives of different laptops and things that I have as well. Um, sorry, I can't, for some reason, it won't let me do this. Oh, there we go, is that it? Um, let's see. Yay, there we go. That one, that's the one you were talking about, I hope. I believe so. Let's see. <laughs> yeah. Is this it? Right. Um, so then let's see the uh yay that's it great uh, <laughs> excellent and so then one last question because then we're running a little over um oop, let me find it uh it says um oftentimes when doing a show the props feel very temporary you know we're talking about you know throwing away items and you know the the just temporary nature of objects and things um how do you approach a show since uh you are in many ways the curator of those items how do you deal with the fact that you know things are disposable um, it's hard one <laughs> when when because when you're the in the abbey and we're doing so many new works as well as revivals of these older plays and looking at them and um, we had a policy and the policy changes regularly but we generally have a policy where every single play that we put on in the peacock or the abbey is our is, is put is kept together for at least six months because 
the chances are that it might be invited to go somewhere or it might be uh, earmarked for tour or for another. Often the Peacock is kind of our studio experimental space downstairs and often shows will start life down there and then they would move up to the main stage and then maybe go on a tour or whatever. So we tend to keep things together at the end of when we do get out for a show, everything gets boxed, labeled with the show and put, and put together for a period of time. And then eventually, which is going on at the moment actually, um, because COVID put an end to a lot of potential tours and things. So everything has just been sort of sitting. So that stuff will all get deboxed. You you throw out what you can. And also um, if anything is useful to anyone else in any other department. So there's, you know, if you've bought a lot of notebooks or you bought a lot of something, you try and find a home for them where they'll get reused. That's, uh, there's an awful lot of emphasis at the moment on um, being green and, and yeah. Uh, the impact of theatre on the environment is just shocking so we we are trying to recycle things and to give things away there's a lot of great websites so I'm interested in uh, hearing about the ones that, that you have in America but there's other ones coming now where we have you know groups, Facebook groups even in places that will say does anybody want this <laughs> and, and there's and yes. if we can give things away that are useful we do um, and also We've often donated things that we've donated uh, anything that might be useful. We uh, during this is all different uh, ball game, but during the homelessness crisis, there was a, a building that was taken by a group of activists, and they housed homeless people in it over the, over winter. And there was an awful lot of Irish artists involved, and they were only across the river from us. So I was clearing out prop rooms, and I kept taking things across the road. <laughs> so do you want this bookshelf? Do you want this chair? Yeah. So. Um, so we so because of that, then we did have um, a long period where we were we would call up, and I still will call up any of the groups that are looking after the homeless in Dublin and ask them if they want any of this material. If it's any use, um, we will use it. We'll pass it on. Sure. But then, yeah. So it becomes a trying not to keep everything because you obviously can't keep everything, um, and trying to make a judgment call about the things that are going to be difficult or uh, are expensive to get again if you were to revive the play. I think everyone's in the same, everyone struggles with that, I think, in props. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's pretty universal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I have found that, you know, there is there is a huge push for green practices, reducing yeah. and reusing, and I found that um, prop masters are, you know, some of the originators <laughs> of the go-to list. Um, just because, you know, we try to use all the little bits and pieces from all the other departments to, you know, scrabble together um, and, you know, create our make-believe, so. Yeah. Um, oh, so one last question then. Um, how many uh, theater seats are in each of your theaters? Oh, God, that's a hard question. I know. <laughs> we, oh, can, no. we can Google it. Scarlet for me, I don't know. Um, there is... Oh Lord, there's around 400. I know there's more than 400. Everyone in the Abbey is going, oh my God, I can't believe you don't know. This. That's okay. Um, I don't know any of the theater seats in any of my theaters either, so it's okay. There's uh, 400 and something upstairs and there's, uh, God, I think 200 and something downstairs. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. So. Great. Google, Google, look at it. <laughs> well, as a, as a person who went to um college and thought I was going to be an archaeologist slash anthropologist and yeah. you know study people um you know yeah. and ended up in theater <laughs> uh which is as far as I'm concerned um archaeology in reverse yep you know it's like instead of digging in the ground and finding a pot and researching the individual we get to read the script research the individual and then find their pot that's right you know so yeah. um, reverse engineering that's yeah a word. yeah <laughs> So um, I think all of your research has been fascinating and I can't wait to, you know, read a couple of these books that you've mentioned and, you know, so. I went, I went okay, I'm going to dress this like as a proper prop master. Instead of tidying them away, there's the books that I pulled out and I went, no, I can just leave them there and they're yeah, dressed yeah. in the background. <laughs> well, it worked. You're hired. So. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. So thank you so much for being with us here, uh, Emer. And um, all right, so it's time to grab your Sharpies to mark in your calendars for our coming attractions.
You've asked for more Spaminars on crafts and prop building, and we've heard you, as the next three webinars are all props building focused, as you can see here. On June 20th, Tom Fiocchi of Ohio University, not Ohio State. Uh, then on July 18th, we dive into the world of paper props uh, with Miss Natalie Kearns of the Grand Theater, who will talk on the art of authenticity and how we make those paper props shine. On August 15th, Jessica Rosenlieb from the Cleveland Playhouse, Cleveland, uh, will take us through some tips and tricks on upholstery for the stage. And there are so many more Spaminars currently in development, so please stay tuned for our updates and keep those ideas coming. Whatever you guys wanna see, let us know. We will make it happen, collaborative art form. We're all here for each other. So we wanna know what you wanna learn about. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. The links are in our chat, as well as uh, links to donate. It's produced by the Society of Property Artists and Managers with special thanks to the SPAM Education, Publicity and Finance Committees. And thank you again for watching. And thank you so much, Emer, for being here with us. This was fantastic. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs>